Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Sosemski. Um, it is my um, honor to introduce Dr. Laura Mowry. It's also, as with Bill, a homecoming for Dr. Mowry. She did her uh, medical school. Um, in, uh, she went to college across at, at Harvard, medical school at HMS, uh, and then her um, public health degree right here at HSPH. Um, she is now the, the chief science um, the vice president, senior vice president, chief scientific, medical, and regulatory officer. I'm sorry, I think I butchered that at Medtronic. Um, but before she did that, she was um, an interventional cardiologist at the Brigham, had chief scientific officer at the Harvard Clinical Research Institute, now the Bain Institute, uh, where she led the development and implementation of these large trials looking at devices and concurrent pharmacotherapy. Now at Medtronic, she is in charge of the global regulatory and scientific uh, functions at this very large device company. And we're really fortunate because Laura has had lived experience both in academia and in industry. And, and we're thrilled to hear about um, her talk, which is about what can uh, real world uh, evidence contribute to our knowledge after the trials are done. So Dr. Marvin. Thank you, Drew. Um, appreciate it. It's been interesting so far just to listen to the conversation. We're, we're here today to talk about causal inference in observational studies, um, but the elephant in the room is always talking about randomized trials. Um, so I guess because we had a disclosure that Bob is a self-proclaimed clinical trialist, I don't I don't know where I would put myself, but it probably would end on that on that spectrum. I, I did write an article um, on editorial on um, an observational study that that the title was, we still need randomized trials. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think there is this example that you'll see here is an example where there is a complementary role for observational data. It was very important. Um, it wasn't uh, simply uh, because of the cost of randomized trials. Um, part of this has to do also with the responsibility to have timely information for patients. Um, and and I think you'll see that illustrated the interplay between um, the strength of and, and the weaknesses of some randomized trials um, and how that came to be as well as uh, the value in this unique setting of observational studies where um, using um, appropriate methods um, there are some important findings that had relevance for, for patients so this example is of using a drug that's used um, that had been used for, for many decades before in oncology, and that's the Taxol family of, of drugs. It had also been used for about a decade for coronary interventions on stents. Um, and it revolves around a question about whether when used um, in the lower extremities was associated with mortality risk um, and how, how that was approached. So just to give a bit of background on the medical context before we jump in, because it's, it's always relevant when we're talking about um, uh, potential confounding and, and, and bias in, in observational studies. This is a patient population uh, who have peripheral artery disease, which is um, felt uh, with the pain in the legs with walking or at rest that's caused by a blockage in the arteries that supply the blood to the, to the lower limbs. Um, and uh, there had already been um, well-established treatments with um, either surgery or um, treatment with percutaneous treatments going in with a catheter, a balloon or a stent, or the removal of plaque to open the channel to supply the blood to the lower extremity. Um, and this is in a patient population that really have a lot of limitations and comorbidities. Um, as you can see here, many, many patients are diabetic. Um, they have other cardiovascular disease um, and multiple risk factors. Um, and in 2019, this was the third leading cause of atherosclerotic um, death after coronary disease and stroke. So in the specific area of the use of medical devices um, in the treatment of these patients, um, there had been randomized trials. Um, they had been fairly small um, and they were designed really to look at the patency of the vessels. And they were used to compare um, those stents that would, or stents or balloons that would open the vessel uh, with, that had, were either with or without the drug. Um, so randomization to see the impact um, of the presence of the drug during the procedure or on the, on the device implant or the stents that remained in the body. Um, 
And the goal there was to avoid patients needing to have repeat procedures uh, because the way the drug works in this case is to avoid the re-narrowing of the arteries that re would reduce the flow um, again to the, the legs. Um, and uh, this was a very frequent problem that um, over a quarter of patients within six months would need to have a repeat procedure because of the recurrence of pain in their legs and the recurrence of uh, narrowing um, that was causing that pain. So about three years after um, these devices were introduced, um, there was an investigator who performed a meta-analysis of the published trials that had follow-up beyond one year um, and revealed a hazard ratio um, that was significantly showing harm for the drug-coded devices um, at, with a hazard ratio of 1.6 at two years. Um, and this was, as you can see, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but I, I won't focus entirely on the randomized trials in this case, but this was based on a number of fairly small randomized trials um, with unbalanced randomization to enrich for the patient population treated with the device um, and with very variable follow-up. Um, and this was a trial level meta-analysis. It wasn't using the original patient data. Nonetheless, you can imagine the concern that arose in seeing this risk it was not at all anticipated um, that mortality would be something that would uh, relate to the use of this, the local treatment with this drug, um, especially given the, the vast history with the drug in other circumstances where that hadn't been observed. Um, the FDA quickly convened an advisory panel meeting and many investigators, um, as well as um, the industry that manufactures these devices, um, uh, prepared a tremendous amount of information. And in that review, um, it was clear that the randomized data had significant limitations. At the time of their publications, um, first they were small trials, they were designed for efficacy, as I mentioned, and not for mortality. And most trials didn't really emphasize to the clinical sites the importance of follow-up beyond the primary endpoint. The emphasis was really on the primary endpoint. And so while they continued to follow these patients, the follow-up rates were as you know were, were ranging in the 60 to 70 percent range, which that in and of itself would be a, a cause for bias. There was a lack of blinding beyond the fifth year, and um, and then there were uh, several um, post-randomization confounders. And at the time, there there was an important randomized trial that I'll that I'll mention in a moment that was significantly larger. It was not industry sponsored. It was independently run. Um, but it was relatively slow to enroll. So we, we also didn't, we didn't have answers, even though there was a larger randomized trial um, at, the, at that time. So to show you the overall timeline, um, this meta-analysis that I referred to was at the end of 2018. Um, and the, some of the things that I'll show you that have come forth since uh, came out in the subsequent years or at the F FDA panel. That large randomized trial that I mentioned is called SWEDPAD, and that's still enrolling. Um, so we're now, um, that, that's been, that's a trial that's been in progress essentially since 2018. So sometimes um, it's not simply the cost of the trial, but it, it may sometimes also be the duration and the fact that this is a product that was on the market. We needed to have an answer to be able to advise uh, patients what to do. Um, and and um, I can maybe just as an aside, um, speak from the chair of somebody who, I had I had just moved from academia to industry in 2018, um, and um, I was relieved actually um, at in our internal conversations that really the first question that was asked of me, you know, as an investigator, but now sitting on in within the company, was what do you really think is happening here? So I think we we do really want to know what's really happening, and that's the basis for the collaborations and the analysis of data that occurs um, uh, to be able to analyze something like this. So before I jump into um, a few of the studies, um, I'll just mention the framework that that you know I might think about this with. And I, I think this is very simple, a very simple schematic, because I know I know there's much more depth um, to the to the methods around um, causal inference that we could go into with this audience. But the value um, of, of these different types of data sets, I think is worth just calling out at a high level. Um, randomization, um, 
yes, we avoid that selection bias, um, but we have to then have that unbiased ascertainment of the of the endpoints, um, which, I, as I mentioned before, we had some challenge with because of the lack of emphasis on that mortality follow up. Um, Meta analysis then has the same limitation. It has a strength if you have more information, um, but it still brings that same bias into into play. Um, and then uh, the real world comparative analysis that we had uh, were able to access uh, was very important. Um, the limitation is obviously overcoming bias and confounding, uh, but gave power um, and certainly gave more opportunity to see more diverse sets of information and generalizability. Um, so I'll refer to a few studies here, and it's interesting because um, uh, Eric Sosemski is the lead author on a couple of them. Um, and the, thankfully, the methods that he just presented are essentially the same. So I'm not going to go into detail um, on the methods, although I, I, I encourage in the discussion if there are questions, we can, we can talk about those more. Um, but very similar uh, perspective of using a perspective analysis plan, using um, um, inverse probability treatment weights uh, for adjustment and, and other methods to look at the, um, the uh, sensitivity analysis around that, um, that um, were also blinded to outcome, as you mentioned earlier, also performed um, in a way that prospectively gathered input from multiple stakeholders, including the FDA prior to analysis, um, so that so that um, so that we can have that um, combined um, intelligence, really, or insight as to whether whether um, the methods set up prospectively um, were as robust as, as possible for the for the analysis plan. So this first study is a safe PAD study, which analyzed Medicare beneficiaries, and at the it just is a tremendous amount of information as you can see in comparison to the smaller cohorts that I described in the. We're going from about 2,000 patients in, in combined randomized trials to 160,000 patients in the safe PAD study. Oh, thanks. Um, and you have the added advantage that we're looking here at an endpoint that has almost complete ascertainment, which is actually better than the randomized trials were. Um, so that's a unique feature that made these data um, as, as you might say, fit for purpose for this type of an analysis. Um, and this data showed um, after, um, after the adjustment mentioned um, really a null effect um, in terms of mortality and similar consistent effects across multiple subgroups um, that were analyzed. Um, a complementary set of information was analyzed um, with the Optum database. Um, and this we performed this um, in collaboration together with uh, Dr. Sosemski's group. And this looked at Medicare Advantage population, which is complementary in terms of the characteristics of patients who um, enter into that. It's a smaller set, but has many of the same strengths and has some additional detail in terms of the confounders that might be present. Um, and uh, similarly, you could see um, a hazard ratio that again um, was at the null um, with uh, fairly uh, tight uh, confidence intervals around the null. Um, and then concomitantly, um, some of our colleagues outside of, um, out, really outside of this, uh, this space of medical device industry um, and observational data analysis were performing a randomized trial. Um, and this was a this was not a randomized trial looking at device versus uh, with drug versus no drug. This is a randomized trial looking at a pharmaceutical agent in this patient population, but with a large subset, a co large cohort of patients who were treated um, uh, percutaneously with, um, with devices that either had drug or did not. And so from that set, they were able to perform an observational data analysis with much the same methods, um, again, in collaboration um, with the FDA prospectively, as well as Dr. Sosebski's group, and uh, the value of this data set um, really was that this was a trial. So this was a randomized trial. So the methods for ascertainment and the primary endpoint was longer than a year. So were the, the methods for ascertainment were, were significantly higher um, than, um, than the previous randomized trials. And um, the other endpoints were ascertained with more reliability than the observational data, as well as the confounders. So 
um, this was really helpful um, information to use um, and also showed that null effect. Um, you can see the positive effect in terms of the treatment efficacy in the lower panel where that repeat procedure that I talked about, which is the whole reason um, for, to, for, to, to have a drug on the device, um, it was significantly reduced, the treatment. So you see in this patient population where their patients are not selected for, um, for treatment with the drug-coded device per se, um, there was a treatment benefit and, and no mortality difference. So these were really helpful um, studies some of them were available um, at the time of that panel um, and then continued follow-up. Um, and then others came out um, later on in the, in the year and a half following that time. But overall, over the past few years, there have been multiple um, observational studies. And actually, if we had more time, going through each of them and comparing and contrasting them would be a good lesson in um, some of the pitfalls uh, with observational data, which you'll, you, you will see a, a bit of a reflection of in a, a later slide because not all of these sets of data have complete ascertainment of the endpoint. Not all of these sets of data have um, confounders that we might desire. Um, and, and not all of them use the same um, types of methods for adjustment or analysis. Um, and, uh, but the, the value I think is the diversity of the, of the data sets, um, both in terms of the source of information and geography um, and the types of patients included. Um, and overall, looking across all of these, they've either had a null effect or a favorable effect for the drug-coded devices. And I would take the favorable effects with a grain of salt because they are uh, they they all appear to be related to some of the gaps in the in the in either the data or the analysis that I, that I mentioned. So to summarize the observational data sets on this topic, you know, I think it's helpful to just take a step back. And these are pretty broad comments that could probably be applied to any other um, observational analysis. So, you know, thinking about are the data fit for this purpose? And that has to do with, do we have the right endpoints? Do, do we have um, the completeness of the data? Do we have sufficient follow-up? And the follow-up has improved over time. Um, so that the median follow-up um, at this point um, is over three years um, in these data sets. Um, and then the analytical considerations, and we could spend a lot more time here. Uh, but the one that I'll emphasize is that last bullet of how important that multi-stakeholder collaboration is, because each party brings something different to the table. I think that's why a session like this is so valuable to have um, this kind of a conversation about the input from the multiple stakeholders at play. So it's the, it's the researchers, it's the physicians who are in practice using the devices, it's, um, it's the methodologists, um, it's those that understand the claims data or wh whichever data source in, in detail and what the flaws might be of that. And then from industry, um, understanding you know, how the devices work and how they're constructed and how they differ across different products. Um, and 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 obviously the regulators as well from their experience also seeing a, a broad array of uh, questions that arise across the medical device industry. Um, so I think that's that was a key component to uh, navigating this challenge, and and it's, I think that's a common theme uh, for many of these um, areas. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about randomized trials uh, before uh, before wrapping and. Um, the study that I mentioned in the beginning had started um, even before um, these devices were approved in the United States because in, in Europe they were available sooner. And um, this was an investigator initiated study. In Sweden, if you don't already know, it's just a remarkable place to be able to do studies because patients enter the health system with a single identifier um, and many, many different sets of information are tracked to that identifier. Um, and as a result, there's a tremendous interest in doing real world um, studies. Um, and so these investigators were doing a randomized trial, but with the follow up being um, uh, much more pragmatic and using these sources of data. Um, so these investigators stopped, they paused their trial because of this question that occurred um, and uh, determined that it was valuable to do an interim analysis. And that's what's shown here, published in the New England Journal with a null effect 
um, there, they were only halfway through their enrollment um, and had, as you can see, the median fall was less than, um, was, um, was around two years. Um, but um, a null effect, and that is continuing and will be available um, within the next year or so for the final results. So if you look across the spectrum, there has been um, uh, a number of studies and I, I would, I'm not gonna focus on the stuff on the left uh, because that's just the recurring analyses of the same set of data that as the follow-up um, of patients improved <coughs> with lowering that loss to follow-up of mortality, the hazard ratio diminished. So that's, that's just showing you that as the information improved that the signal came closer to the null. It's really the observational data side. I, the ones that I highlighted were, are highlighted in blue um, in that observational panel on the right. Um, and the other ones, you can see there's a variability in the effects shown. Um, and that goes back to, it, this could be a good case study for the variation in how observational data analysis is done. Um, I wanna show you this slide. It's, it's, a, it's actually an example of complete lack of adjustment for anything, because this is just showing you over time uh, what has happened for device utilization um, and for these types of devices in the United States and the impact um, this is, that this has on what, what physicians do. Um, and so you can see about a 30% uh, percent reduction as a result following that initial meta-analysis. And then gradually as data have accumulated, there's been more utilization. I wish I had for you the impact on patient outcomes um, and I think this is analysis that, you know, would be very important to look at. Um, it's, uh, we can't attribute any single thing, obviously, to these trends, uh, but it is a, it's a pretty striking finding. So um, to summarize, um, I won't go all through all the points, but maybe just emphasize the last two points here, um, which are that, you know, real world data and, and analysis had a really important complementary role to the randomized data. And this had to do with the fact that there was a large information set with a reliable endpoint on the, uh, at hand for mortality. Um, and it could be analyzed almost immediately when the question arose. Whereas the randomized trials were flawed for this question. They weren't designed to answer this question. Um, and the larger randomized trials um, are still continuing to enroll. So we still don't really have a definitive answer on that. Um, at the same time, the variation that you see in observational data, as we all know in this room, is really reliant on the quality of the information and the analytic plan and its appropriateness for the question at hand. So I think um, I think this is a, it's a pretty it's been a pretty good example. And unfortunately, a recurring theme. Um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, it's probably a good thing that we have access to these data to identify. Um, our better understanding of how these devices perform um, in the real world. But the, it illustrates, I think, some of the challenges that we have um, and that we face. So thanks very much and appreciate it. In meta analysis. Um, and this makes me wonder uh, are there any lessons learned you know, drawn from that meta analysis? You mentioned from the predictive one, but that doesn't really explain the imbalances. It's just that bug. Um, is it, are there any, any sort of anything that would be drawn out of that? So the next time you see an underlying meta analysis, you know, yeah. Um, that's a, it's a, it's a, oh, the question was, um, next time we see an alarming meta-analysis, what will we do differently so that we can avoid, um, anything that might be misleading from that and are there lessons learned? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I think reading the, um, and the meta-analysis is also an illustration of, um, a lot of learnings that could be made. So, it's the types of data that were entered into the study, the, um, the lack of having individual patient level data uh, was also a limitation. Um, the methods themselves for the meta-analysis were, were also limited. Um, but I think, I don't think that's gonna avoid the circumstance in the future. Um, 
I mean, I look back to the same, essentially the same scenario happened back in 2006 um, with um, questions around coronary stents where a meta-analysis prompted, um, prompted, you know, prompted the large randomized trial that, that Drew described that we conducted that took us eight years to be able to, to complete. Um, and um, that, was, that was relevant. I think it was important at that time. But, but similarly, I think when, I don't think we'll be able to stop for analysis from happening or um, that getting attention. We just need to be able to respond to it. You know, we were talking the last night about how do we teach uh, more quickly so that um, so that there's better understanding in the this whole stakeholder community of physicians, um, industry regulators, academics of how to do a proper meta analysis. We could sit in this room, and I think mm -hmm. we would all agree about how to do many of these things better. But that wouldn't have an impact if we don't have you know, the people who review our articles being able to do the same thing um, and the community that needs to receive the information and then utilize it, being able to do the same thing. I think that's the real challenge. Um, and I think this, this symposium is a great example of how we start to do that, but how do we get the word out more broadly, I think is remains a challenge. Thanks.